Well, good evening. I know I don't look like Earl tonight, but, um, and I'll never be able to take his place, but um, he's just a little tad under the weather tonight, and he wanted us, he made it to the TV station, he made it to our house, but then when he got out here, he said, uh, will you going to take over because he said, I don't feel good, and I think I'm going to go home. And um, when I showed him my fist, you know, he, he wasn't really impressed by it. So I said, fine, go on home then. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to try to do something here tonight. I don't know how well it'll turn out, but we need your prayers tonight. Earl needs your prayers, so I would um, like for you to remember him. And um, as we go into the service tonight, I'm going to ask uh, Ron if he'll come and bless the service for us tonight. Ron? Let me see. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you give us yeah. live with you. Praise Again, you. Lord, we thank you for giving us our sins by dying on the cross, yeah. by shedding your blood for that. We also thank you, Lord, for the giving us a spirit as a gift that would teach us and guide us and keep us within your uh, your way of path, straight path that we need to walk. Now go with us tonight, strengthen us as we do everything. Hopefully we will bring another thing to bring praise and glory to your name for all this fast in your holy place in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, our scripture tonight. Um, and I know you all have heard it so many, many times that it is in Luke 15, 1 through 7. It says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable, saying unto them. Now, you know, when Jesus was on earth and uh, he, he talked in parables to us and to the people there, because if you give somebody an example of what you're trying to tell them, it's like drawing them a picture. So with these parables that he was speaking of, that give the people back then a knowledge of what he was trying to get across to them. And, uh, you know, the Pharisees and the scribes, they was always trying to find something wrong with him. And they said, this man receiveth sinners. And he even goes and he eats with them. Well, what are we supposed to do? We are people on this earth today that we should not be treating one person any different than we do anybody else, whether they're Christian people or whether they're sinners. And, and in this second verse, Jesus even went and eat with the sinners. So we're not any better than he is. So, I mean, you know, how many times have you went into a restaurant and ate your dinner? Do you think they're all Christians in there? No. There are plenty of sinners in there. And, you know, it really does my heart good to say... Uh, we always say the grace, bless the food, and it makes no difference who's in there. You don't know what saying that grace is going to do to a sinner sitting at the next table. So, I mean, I've even done this at restaurants that I've been to. When I see somebody pray, I, when I'm ready to leave, I know a lot of people would think, well, boy, she's really bold, and she's coming over there talking to people that she doesn't even know, 
And I go over to those people and I thank them for praying. And I was down to a restaurant one day and I got up and I walked over and this man and woman was sitting at the table. Now I thought they were Christians and but I didn't know for sure. So whenever they finished their meal and they had blessed it and everything, I walked over to them and I said, I want to thank you for praying for your meal. And they looked at me real strange like and they said, I don't guess anybody had ever told them that before, but they looked up at me and they said, we always pray for our meal. And I said, well, I just want people to know that it's not a disgrace to pray in front of a whole dining room or whatever. You know, always pray for your food. And I have seen and I know of a lot of Christian people that do pray. Some that I know has don't in a public place, but we always make it um, an attempt to pray in front of, you know, when we're getting, after we've gotten our food. And um, this is what Jesus was doing. Now, we're supposed to be Christ-like. So how much more Christ-like can you be than eating with sinners as Jesus did? And then he told them in this parable here, he said, What man of you having a hundred sheep, and if he lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he finds it? Now, you know, um, Back then, uh, the Pharisees, they really didn't know what he was talking about. So he gave them this example as the sheep. I remember one time I was in Sunday school. I hadn't been a Christian, but just maybe a couple weeks at the most. And I was asked... um, when uh, Jesus told Peter to go feed his sheep, this particular person looked at me and said, Wilda, what does he mean? And me being somebody that, yeah, I grew up in church, but it never meant anything to me, so I really didn't know what he was talking about. So anyway, this person asked me, well, what is he talking about? And I said, well, I don't know. I guess he's got a bunch of sheep out there that needs to be fed. And he's asking Peter to feed his sheep. And, uh, of course, it drew a laugh from the church members that was there. And I said, well, what did I say wrong? And, see, I didn't know really what was going on until it was explained to me. Who is the sheep? Okay? I'm sorry, I didn't know. I wasn't being funny, but, you know, a new babe in, in, in Christ, I, didn't, I just didn't know what they were talking about. So if it had been explained in maybe into a parable where I could have kind of pictured it in my mind, you know, then maybe I could have explained it a little bit better. But anyway, I thought they was sheep out in the field eating and it was dinner time for them, so I just, that's what I told them. But anyway, on the example that he gave here, he was telling them that he had 99 sheep in the wilderness. And there was one that he had to go look for. He had a hundred, 
but he had 99 that he could take count of. And um, this one little sheep was lost. And he was going to go find it. The shepherd was looking for it. And that one little sheep meant just as much to him as that 99 did. So in actual, actual um, actuality, this one little sheep that was lost meant a little bit more than the 99. And the reason why it is, is that people, when you are in a congregation and something comes up on you or on a group of people, uh, 99 people could ward off whatever had come against them, but this one little sheep that they had uh, that was lost, then he had no one to help him. So the shepherd made up his mind that he was going to go find that one little sheep. So it's the same way with us today. How many are there in a group of people that are in church that actually go out and look for one that has not come back to church for three or four days or three or four weeks? You know, how many of us will come back and say, well, you know, I, so-and-so wasn't here last Sunday, so I went out and I looked for him. I looked and I talked to him to see why he wasn't here last Sunday. And that's the same way the shepherd did. That one sheep that was lost meant as much to him as those 99. Amen. <clears throat> so it's, you know... There's a lot of people out here in this world that need for someone else to go look after them, talk to them, tell them about the Lord. And <clears throat> you never know. It might not be in your lifetime, but it might be in somebody else's that they will say, you know, I was a sinner and somebody come and they talk to me about Jesus. And that's when I got to thinking about it. And then later on in my lifetime, I turned my life over because some one person went out and talked to me. So when it goes on here in verse 5, it said, And when he hath found it, he laid it on his shoulders rejoicing. Now, you don't have to necessarily be the sheep, but how many times when you have been in problems has the Lord picked you up and carried you and took you out of the problems that you've been in? So the shepherd, when he found it, he picked it up, put it across his shoulders, rejoicing, and he took it home. It said, and when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, and to, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I can just see him having a party because of that little sheep that was lost, and the master thought, that it was gone forever. No, he didn't eat him. He fed him. And he fed him because it probably had been days since he was gone. And I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine which need no repentance. You've got a hundred people in a crowd. 
And what it is here is that 99 of them are Christians. Now, I know that if we had 99 people in our church, we'd be tickled to death. But don't you think we'd be just as happy for that other one that came in than the 99 that was already there? So uh, we as Christians have got to consider that when you go out and you pray for somebody, you don't know what that prayer is going to do for you. And you don't know what it's going to do for the other one. Remember the scripture that says, when you do it unto the least of these, you do it unto me. And that interpretation of that is, when you do it unto the least of these, which he's saying that when you're doing it for me and you go out and you talk to someone and you win that soul, or whether you feed them, whether you close them, whatever you do to help that one person, it's the same as you're doing it to Jesus Christ himself. And I want to leave with you tonight... Um, Something that maybe you can think about this week was that scripture. And whenever you go out, you go to the store, whatever you do, try to speak Jesus' name because somebody is going to need the word of God. <clears throat> this song that I got tonight I told Brother Paul Sunday that I would send this out to him. And Paul, this one's for you. I hope it's the right song. <clears throat> if I can sing. I got my frog, so I don't really know. Um, it's called Wilt Thou Be Made Whole. I don't know whether I can see or not. little bit around. Okay. <laughs> Jesus came to Bethesda's pool where the cripple did wait for the water to move. A man had been lame for 38 years. <clears throat> he asked him this question that still rings in my ears. Wilt thou be made whole? Do you want a new life? Wilt thou be made whole and believe in Christ? Do you want to be washed as white as the snow? God's question to you, wilt thou be made whole? <clears throat> He said, there is no man to help me in the pool. I tried to get up. There's nothing I can do. Then Jesus said, rise, take up thy bed and go. 
and by his faith he was made whole wilt thou be made whole do you want a new life wilt thou be made whole and believe in Christ do you want to be washed as white as snow God's question to you Wilt thou be made whole? Wilt thou be made whole? Do you want a new life? Wilt thou be made whole? And believe in Christ? Do you want to be washed? As white as the snow. God's question to you. Will thou be made whole? God's question to you. Will thou be made whole? Okay, Ron. Ron's going to do his thing now. <laughs> Ron, Audra, whoever. Do her favorite song tonight. That has a lot of meaning to it. The old rugged cross. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The ending of suffering And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll carry the old rugged cross, heal my trophies that last I made. Sunday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged crown, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above. Oh, 
I will ever be true. It's shame and repose gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown very much. Honey, would you like to come up here and take us? we got about three more minutes. Come on. <coughs> what, you want me to do, sing a song? Yes. Short and sweet. Don't talk, just sing. Oh. <laughs> you heard that. It's nice to be here and I uh, hope you enjoyed the program that we filled in with Brother Earl. Everybody get in the gear D. I'm going to sing a little old song that came out in Around 1955, Only Wheeler put this out. Uh, believe it or not, he's Roy Cuss' brother-in-law. And uh, everybody is looking forward to this. Listen to the words. Would you like to wear a crown And lay all your burdens down Where there's eternal life No more struggle, no more strife would you like to wear a crown? Won't it be sweet up in heaven With the pretty white clouds all around With the angels flying around you And the bone in your head there's a crown Now the crown wasn't made for kingdom or a crown upon his throne Or the crown was made for the Savior To choose the right from the wrong Would you like to wear a crown And lay all your burdens down where there's eternal life, no more struggle, no more strife. Would you like to wear a crown? Would you like to wear a crown? Bless his name. Don't forget to pray for Brother Earl. Um, he's getting a bad cold. Uh, just remember him in your prayers tonight, the rest of the week, and we just hope and pray that he'll be back with us next week. I hope it don't linger on any longer. If it does, Ron's got it next week then. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, God bless you until we meet on here again. Good night, and we love you.